Welcome to the Open to Hope Show in partnership with the Compassionate Friends. I'm your host, Dr. Heidi Horsley, and I'm here today with my co-host and mother, Dr. Gloria Horsley. Hi, Mom. Hi, Heidi. Well, we've got an interesting two guests today, which I always love having two on, but it's going to be one of the most unique two guests that we've had on because we're going to be talking about a very interesting book called My Life After Death. It's a memoir from heaven. We are going to have two guests on today. Dr. Elisa Medhus and Kim Babcock. Uh, Dr. Elisa Medhus practiced internal medicine for 30 years in Houston. After the death of her son, Eric, she began journaling her grief in her blog and communicating with him. An author and radio host, Dr. Medhus will be joined by Kim Babcock, who is a spirit translator for Eric. She and Eric are the authors of My Life After Death, A Memoir from Heaven. Welcome to the show, Elisa and Kim. Well, thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you for having us. And I guess uh, I should be uh, welcoming Eric to the show, too. <laughs> Hi, Eric. Like, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Eric uh, was uh, had a bipolar disorder. Is that right, uh, Lisa? Uh, yes, and he had learning differences. He also had Tourette. He was bullied mercilessly by wow. peers and even teachers. One teacher I remember called wow. him stupid. So he kind of had a miserable life. I mean, That's in awful. our family, we surrounded him with love and encouragement. But, uh, you know, Heidi, bipolar disease is often a terminal one. And you know, in his case, it, it certainly was. Wow, that's heartbreaking. So he took his life. Uh, uh, he shot himself. Is that correct? That's right. And then uh, I know in your book, I was uh, reading it, he talks about, very interesting, about how he, you know, about doing that and about how he felt about it and uh, the family and all that kind of thing. It's it's, it's very interesting. I, I just wondered um, how it came about to be translated. How did you start out in this process? Well, it was particularly difficult for me because, uh, you know, I'm a physician slash scientist, right. mm -hmm. and I was raised by atheists. So when Eric died, I I didn't know what happened to him. I is he gone forever? I had no conception of life after death until, uh, I'm going to say like three days after his death, my father, who is a milit or was a militant atheist, called me in a panic saying that Eric had just appeared before him and, uh, you know, and then morphed into his little child self and crawled up to his lap. So he's like, Elisa, I'm so startled. I don't know what to believe. He would not say something like that to make me feel better. Mm hmm so he saw Eric, and, and that changed my whole paradigm. And that's what made me start to go on my journey and read everything I could about consciousness survival and near-death experiences and, and, you know, quantum physics, everything that I could understand at least. And, um, and at the same time, we started getting all sorts of really hardcore signs from Eric that were inexplicable. I remember in, in your blog you saying that, you know, early on a lot of other people were receiving signs, but you weren't. And then finally Eric appeared to you and was jumping around on the bed with your sister watching who had also died? Oh, gosh, yeah, that was just crazy because I was awake. I didn't even wow. put my head down on the pillow. Then there he was jumping, popping like a bunny rabbit from one side to the other, and it's like this can't be happening. But it's, it's really weird because I'm, I was such a skeptic that even though he would make unplugged appliances work or drop um, airsoft BBs, have them materialize at the ceiling and drop to the floor and just turn deadbolts while we watch, turn on faucets full blast while we watch, wow. call us on the telephone, even though all that happened, time would sort of pass and then doubt would sort of creep in. So it, it took me probably four years until I really got to that. I am 100% sure that my son lives on and just in some other dimension. I've read that a lot of parents will seek the help of a medium to connect with their child. So I thought, you know, what have I got to lose? So I tried it. And it was just so uncannily accurate. I mean, they were able to describe his, the first medium, Jamie Butler, was able to describe his personality so clearly, was able to say exactly what he was wearing at the time, that he killed himself with a gun, what kind of gun was, was it that he was sitting at his desk, and all these, and his sailor tongue, you know, that he uses. It, it, so I kept booking, a point, uh, you know, sessions. And then I started asking 
uh, uh, you know, at first, just personal questions, right? Like why and what did we do wrong? What could we have done to save you? But eventually I started asking what was death, what is death like and what is the afterlife like and what is it like to live as a spirit? So, so Elisa, to back up for a minute, when you asked him what you could have done to save him, what, did he, what did, was his response? Because I know a lot of bereaved parents and siblings out there are wondering the same thing. Yeah, everybody goes through this deal. Mm-hmm. What, what could I have done? There was nothing. Mm-hmm. Th- this was apparently a spiritual contract for him. He designed this life to uh, to come and hear him be miserable so that mm-hmm. he could develop the listening skills and the compassion and et cetera that he needs uh, to become a good spirit guide, which is what he does now with the blog members. I, I was talking to my husband the other day, and I said, would you want Eric back even if you knew he'd be miserable? And my husband said, yes, because mm-hmm. I would always have hope that I could make him happy. Right. And that's kind of the way I feel, too. And I, I, I suppose it's normal for parents to feel that way when they lose a child, which is pretty much the most horrible thing that can happen to a human being. Mm-hmm. Well, let me ask, um, uh, Kim, how did you get into being a medium? Well, it's, <clears throat> it's definitely something that I have experienced all my life but not until my adulthood did I actually understand it. Going through different experiences, seeing things, hearing things, and even feeling things, like actual physical touch when I was by myself, you know, but not feeling threatened by it, um, I didn't understand what that was. And But the biggest thing I knew was nobody else in my family was experiencing this, so I must, you know, <laughs> something strange must be going on with me. So I sort of ignored it. And then for a brief period of time, um, nothing was happening. And um, it wasn't until my husband lost his grandfather and and, um, his grandfather just kept appearing to me and um, showing me this pocket watch that he has. And finally, I I spoke with my mother-in-law. She, you know, still has that pocket watch to this day. So in that experience, I realized, okay, a communication process just occurred. And her having that pocket watch validated that for me, that there was something real happening, that even though I couldn't put my hands on it and it wasn't tangible, it it was still validated. So, uh, you know, through that, I just began honoring what I felt, what I saw, and what I heard, and paying attention to it, listening to it, because I didn't feel threatened by it in, in any way. You know, I just, it felt like it came from a good source, whatever information it was or images. So I just began to re- read books, and, and um, honestly, the titles of these books came to me clairvoyantly. I would see them. And um, so I read books that helped me understand um, all the different you know, psychic senses, if you will, and other books that helped put structure to it and organize it. And um, you know, in that growth and development, I just started actually working professionally on the side as a medium while also doing physical therapy. So... I always used to laugh that, you know, my day job was something very physical and my my side job was very spiritual. So very different, but still in the same in that, you know, my intentions are just to help people however I can. So, you know, in this process, you know, I have just a, a small amount of very spiritual friends that sort of understand. And one of them actually um, gave me Eric's book and uh-huh. um, had some pretty cool experiences with his book flying off the shelf a couple times, and then he actually gave me that book in a dream, kind of saying, pick it up and read it, because I, I had had it for months before I actually read it. And so then after I read it, it you know, I'm very open-minded. It changed my world and the way I communicate with spirit, and also helped me, um, you know, let go of some fears in that process. What do you think Eric wants us to know? You know, I know where he is. I know what he does all the time. I mean, it's, it's just... There's this sense of knowing. So it's almost like I've transformed my mindset. Yeah. I feel like he's just studying abroad in some college and that he's going to walk through the, the door any moment with all his dirty laundry. Where is he and what does he do? Because I know that that's a huge question for all of us. Well, he's in a parallel dimension, you know. Mm-hmm. There are ult- uh, infinite number of dimensions, he says, that are sort of swirled in on top of each other. And he and all our loved ones are in that one particular dimension that uh, he likes to call home. And uh, his, he spends his time visiting us, of course, his family, hanging out with us, 
and then he he uh, goes to uh, to different blog members and gives them a little love, pranks them, etc. Mm-hmm. Uh, he spends time uh, learning things. Uh, he has a lot of free time that he likes to do fun things. So, um, and then uh, he goes and pranks the other side of the world, mm-hmm. the time the other time zones, and you know. It does funny things with with people, and they love it. They get jealous of, of each other if one gets a prank from him, and oh, I want a prank, you know. So it's kind of cute. Just How do for, you two work together? Yeah. What does that look like? Well, uh, Kim and I have uh, you know uh, Skype each other, and I will ask uh, Eric different questions uh, during the okay. session, like the importance of you know how do you find your authentic self? How do you get over grief, for example? One thing I want to interject before I forget it, because I'm 60 years old, so you know the mind is going, is that, um, you know, for for all you guys out there who have lost somebody, one thing that Eric's taught me is that they're not really lost. They just don't happen to have a physical body. They they are there, but without any mental health or physical health issues, and they are happy. There's no reason why we can't continue to have a relationship with them. And in our Western culture... Once they are gone and buried or cremated, we like let them rest in peace, forget about them, move on with your life, and that's really not what they want. And Eric teaches a lot of ways that we can communicate, even without a medium, with our loved ones. Right, right. And what are some of those? Eric, you could probably share some of those. Uh-huh. He says, well, he says, um, the ways that you are connected with your loved one in the physical life shouldn't, don't have to change if they no longer have a physical body. So it's through mostly and mainly, he says, <laughs> through your heart. Um, listening to your heart when you intend to connect with them, what do you feel? And then he repeated himself. He says, what do you feel? Pay attention to what you feel. Um, but, but also, he says, just as important, where you put focus and energy is also going to depict how you stay connected. So if you focus on, I've lost them, I've lost them, I've lost them, it's going to be really hard to maintain a connection <clears throat> because you are stuck on that thought of the absence of them. So um, first you have to become one with the understanding and accept the understanding that you haven't really lost anybody. It's just that the dynamics have changed a little bit about that relationship. So most importantly, he says, approach it through your heart. Feel it um, when you try to stay connected to your loved ones. If you listen to your heart and the way you feel in those connections that you're trying to maintain, um, he says, that'll open up other avenues for you. What, what would Eric like to tell people out there that are grieving a loss right now and really don't know how they're going to survive? One of the biggest things he says, I don't want people to have fear. They get so afraid. When they go through the loss of a loved one, they, they begin to fear because it brings a reality, a sense of um, realness to, and then he's doing air quotes around the word loss. Um, so they start to develop fear and thinking, well, who's next? Or, well, how much longer do I have? That was so unexpected. Or um, even if it wasn't unexpected, still the loss and the absence of them physically can be so jarring that it instills fear. So I don't want people to be afraid after going through the loss of a loved one. What What do you have to say about suicide as far as the fact that so many people feel guilt? that they should have known or they should have done more? He says, well, that that happens almost in every case, every situation, looking back. I should have seen the red flags. Well, I knew it, but I didn't do anything about it. Um, Ultimately, you have to understand that each and every journey is everybody's individual journey. Um, It is not your responsibility to change anybody else's journey. It never was, ever, ever, he says. So... As abrasive as that might come across, he says, know that even though you may have seen signs and the red flags, but you didn't do anything about it, you're ultimately not responsible for their life, even if you're a mom, even if you're a sibling. Um, Therefore, you can't hold yourself responsible for their death. Mm. So he says that only belongs to one source and one source only. And he's referring to God. 
So you have to understand that you are not responsible for changing somebody else's journey. There's one simple communication technique that Eric taught me called the hand game that might help uh, uh, people who are so deep in grief that they really can't pick up on their child's energy or their person's energy, mm -hmm. loved one. Uh, and that's, it's called the hand game. You take both hands, palms up, and you designate one as your yes and one as your no. You ask a yes or no question, obviously, like, are you here? And then try to discern a difference in sensation in one of those hands. It might be a difference in temperature. Uh, I feel Eric blowing on my hand. Uh, sometimes it might be a numbness, a tingling, and so on. And if you can't feel anything after a, a minute or two, then you can, it's okay to say, hey, make it stronger. Make it stronger until you can finally discern a difference. And, and that's a really simple way to sort of start the communication. But there is science behind why, for example, I did not receive any signs from Eric uh, when I was in my deepest grief. That's because everything is energy, including matter, which Einstein referred to as frozen light. You know, Even we are energy. And when we're grief-stricken, our energy, the frequency of it goes way down. So you have this long electromagnetic spectrum where all that includes all the different energetic frequencies of everything, we are in that tiny sliver called the visible range, okay? When we are grief-stricken, our frequency of our energy falls all the way down to the, to the bottom of the, physical, of the visible range, you know, and, and outside of the visible range, you have x-rays and microwaves and, and all that. Well, when you're that low, and by the way, that's why we use terms like I'm depressed or I'm feeling low, then the spirit your loved one who vibrates at a frequency higher than the visible range has a really hard time dropping their, their frequency down so that they can, you know, give you a sign or manifest in front of you, et cetera. Try to think about joyful memories or watch a stand-up, my favorite stand-up um, comedian, et cetera. Mm -hmm. To raise your vibration. That's right. interesting because uh, I think that people want a sign right away and maybe uh, – Maybe they don't pay enough attention later on. Well, also, Mom, it would explain why some people that aren't as close to the person that died get the visitations first. That's mm. exactly the way it is. And we get annoyed by that, but the reality is our vibration is too low. Our energy is too low to get to get it, so it makes sense. Well, tell us where uh, we can find you guys, and uh, this book is really very interesting, My Life After Death, A Memoir from Heaven, and it is by Eric with his mom. Well, we, you can find our blog at channelingeric.com, and Eric is spelled with a K. Uh, Kim, you're at kimbabcock.net. K-I-M-B-A-B-C-O-C-K.net. Right. Uh, Kim, starting with you, I would like you to, uh, and maybe if Eric wants to speak through either of you, I would like you to say, uh, to just give us a thought for those people who are newly bereaved. Do you have any thought for them about how, what they need to do or how they can raise their vibration? In my experience as a medium, that's primarily what I do is connect people with the loved ones that they've lost here in the physical world. And um, a couple of things that sort of help people maintain their connection and also relieve some of that grief is um, as hard as it is, you know, when we lose someone, we often develop um, attachments to expectations. Well, I ex this is their personality, and I expect them to to show up this way or to give me a sign like this. And um, so in, in fostering and maintaining that connection with your loved ones on the other side, um, open your hearts and your minds, and, and more importantly, don't talk yourself out of an experience. I think that happens so much. People will say, well, I thought I felt my mom's presence, but, you know, it might have just been you know, just my imagination, or I thought my sister was around and I thought I heard her voice, but I'm probably just thinking it up in my head. Um, off the spirit says that we do that so much it can be frustrating that, you know, we actually have encountered them and we've acknowledged that and we've experienced that, but we often um, discredit them or second-guess what we've experienced. So believe in yourself and what you experience with your loved ones and, and know that know that when they go back home there's no 
you know, people often say, have they crossed over? Are they still facing judgment? You know, there, there's so much that these, these books from Eric can really open up your mind and your heart and change your, your perspective to understand that communication is um, encouraged, you know. Um, maintaining that communication in your relationship is, is highly encouraged from, from their side and from their perspective. So, um, so yeah, you know, through these books, that will teach you how to sort of release that fear of, well, where are they and are they still around? And really helps you to foster, you know, a new type of relationship with them. After that, I, I, I agree that doubt and expectation, like everything else, is, is a form of energy but it's very, very dense. It's really hard for our loved ones to just oh, plow through that. Uh, I, I think the most important part, uh, point I'd like to make is the fact that there's no reason why you can't continue to have a relationship with, with your yeah. loved one. And uh, there, there are skeptics out there. I'm a former skeptic. I believed in, you know, have to have science behind everything. But there is actually science behind all of this. And science is starting to bridge the gap with spirituality. I think we're at the, the same point we were when we thought the, the earth was flat, and then some dude comes up and says, well, the earth is round. And they just, you know, laughed and scorned and so on. Uh, but we finally realized that the earth is, is round. And I think we're going through that transformation with, with the idea of consciousness survival. Schopenhauer, Arthur Schopenhauer, said that truth goes through three phases. First, it scorns, I mean, sorry, first it's ridiculed, then it's scorned, but eventually it's accepted as self-evident. So I want to tell all you grievers out there that the truth is that your loved one is never lost. They are just in another dimension right on top of ours without a physical body and all the issues that a physical body may have. All right. Remind us again where they can get your book and, and how they can get in touch with you. They can blog with you and remind yeah, them the, where it is. The blog is, is just a one, oh gosh, it's just a great community. We have so much fun. And Eric shares so much about death, the afterlife, the life of the spirit, and, and the human experience. Uh, and that's channeling Eric, Eric spelled with a K, dot com. We also, every Thursday night at 7 Central Time, ha have a. Uh, um, a radio show where people can call in and ask Eric questions and even bring their loved ones forth. So that's every Thursday night, and I, I uh, post details about it on Wednesdays and Thursdays. All right. Well, fantastic. And thank you guys for being on the show today, and thank you uh, for what you're doing, and uh, very fascinating. And thanks to Eric also for, for being around and getting involved. Yes, thank you so much for building awareness. That yes, although our loved ones us. are not in our are not physically in our lives, they are still a big presence in our lives. Again, thanks for being on the show, and thanks everybody for listening to the show today. And uh, we hope that if you've lost hope, Heidi and I always want to remind you to lean on ours till you find your own. And God bless. You've been listening to Open to Hope Radio, hosted by Doctors Gloria and Heidi Horsley. Like today's edition, all of our past programs are available on demand at opentohope.com along with helpful articles, videos, resources, and links to help get you through the toughest time of your life. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter and sign up for our monthly newsletter. Again, that's opentohope.com. Check it out today. Then be sure to stop by next Thursday at 9 a.m. Pacific Time when we'll be posting another edition of Open to Hope Radio. Remember, others have been where you are. They made it through, and you can too, as long as you're open to hope.